Moody Hill Road prospecting LCT pegmatites today. This is low. Let's go. First stop, a quartz feldspar, mostly plagioclase, but you can see some pink microcline. And then muscovite. This is a huge pegmatite, metamorphic LCT. And we're here to look for outliers. Quartz, muscovite, and feldspar are the only reported commodities, but we have some black mineral as well. This is likely tourmaline. Mostly massive, but some prismatic habit here. We're gonna move on, hoping things get more interesting. Some of these pegmatites are over a hundred meters long, such as this one trending north, northeast, only eight meters further along the pegmatite and we get a new mineral. This is blue barrel. It's not gem quality, so we cannot call it aquamarine. Only 80 meters further along the very same pegmatite, we get bigger minerals and another new mineral. LCT pegmatites, these metamorphic pegmatites, stands for lithium cesium tantalum and alludes to some of the minerals that you will find in them. Tantalum and niobium form a solid solution series mineral called columbite. This right here, this black mineral is columbite. Columbite has a platy crystal habit or tabular and it does have cleavage and it can be distinguished from tourmaline from its submetallic luster and crystal habit, also its specific gravity. But I just found a bigger piece right up the slope. So let's go take a look just after we see this black tourmaline cross sections of prismatic crystals for comparison. And now this just appeared on the slope. I'm pretty positive that this is columbite a niobium oxide mineral i'm leaving that with the pick as we continue upward and i'll show you some of the other development of minerals right here so this is on par with what the majority of the black tourmaline in this region looks like in the biotite schist this is blue barrel and the barrel gets even bigger right down here not only that one right where this gets into a coarse zone one piece center of the frame Another cotton candy blue found on the surface. I wouldn't even call that blue barrel. I'd call that aquamarine. This is gem quality. Just barely, but gem quality. Finding more pieces of columbite and blue barrel on the surface, but we keep going for now because today is about exploration prospecting. I have eight miles to cover, so let's get up the mountain. But first of all, let's see if we can wiggle out this blue barrel crystal. With the muscovite. More black tourmaline is still trending in the same direction. No barrel so far in this particular pegmatite. Snow White, it's a pegmatite. Moving up the hill above the milky quartz, we've got fine grain albite with quartz interlocking, some muscovite, and as soon as the muscovite gets big, we get barrel crystals. I'm gonna stop here for a bit and trace along this entire thing. See, big books and associated blue barrel. More. Tons more. A lot of this green is sericite green variety of mica before the introduction or maybe minor introduction of chromium. 
you get enough chromium then it's fuchsite but I don't think we're there yet I think it's sericite we followed along that and just below it just above the quartz there's a zone with shoral black tourmaline here it looks like charcoal but it's tourmaline uh, not beautiful but big crystals and just a meter further up more that's beautiful all occurring in a specific zone some barrel more barrel And the zones are linear, so you get the barrel zone up here, got a tourmaline zone, a little back just above the contact of the quartz. Look how beautiful this is. And even more back here. I think I gotta get that one out. Actually, I'm leaving it. Got a lot of rain coming. There's blue barrel over here and then that other attractive specimen right there. So let's flip this over. Well, because of that, we're going slow and steady into all that because it's weathered out of this determined zone of the barrel plus that crystal there. So it's all continuous. Sites, and it's almost becoming more common to see them with barrel than without. I've chiseled down as far as I can, but the bad news is it's a really long crystal, so I think I gotta try to snap it. We go up, just up from it. Here comes the rain. And here comes the barrel. Coming from above. More pegmatites and more barrel. Quartz, 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 smoky quartz, and right next to it is this opaque black mineral. I'm thinking maybe uraninite pitch blend because radiation will ionize the aluminum atoms in quartz inclusions and turn them smoky. So perhaps uh, radioactive. Tourmaline picking up steam. 
This is a barrel. And right down the hill, check that one out. And even more. Greenish. I'm just a little down the hill and sometimes they jump out at you. That is a barrel crystal. And the green, maybe some radioactive mineral. So I got the UV light out. Cheers, moon, for the UV light. And this white encrustation may be a salt formed from the radioactive mineral. So let's check it out with ultraviolet, long wave. And we're gonna switch it to short wave. Just a little faint green in this area. Let's check it out with regular light. That stuff. Some post cleanup notes and overview of the geology of the area. I did not bring back any of the radioactive fluorescent mineral. It was really crumbly and didn't seem safe to transport. However, I did bring back samples of what I thought was uraninite or pitch blend. And the first test that I ran on them was specific gravity, average 3.20. Pitch blend or uraninite is 6.5 to 11, so it cannot be uraninite. Next test that I ran was a streak test. Streak came out to be a red, brown, purple. So that signaled manganese for me and ultimately arrived at the conclusion that these are a manganese phosphate mineral called perperite. Perperite is an oxidation product and a part of a solid solution series group of minerals called the triphylite group. And a solid solution series, for example, is something like feldspar in its varieties. We've got microcline enriched in potassium over here, and we've got albite enriched in sodium over here. Here's the ternary diagram with sodium enriched feldspar and potassium rich feldspar. So that's a solid solution series. So now in terms of the triphylite group, we have two end members based on the dominance of iron in triphylite or manganese in lithophyllite. So these minerals oxidize, leach lithium away, which it's no surprise that we have lithium because we have beryl in the area as well. It oxidizes to cyclorite and then ultimately arrives at perperite, kicking out the lithium. So it's a manganese phosphate mineral and the specific gravity matches the average between 3.2 and 3.4 of this mineral species. Something interesting about perperite is upon exposure to acid, it will turn purple. So let's do that right now. My theory is why it becomes purple is that the acid is putting microscopic pits in the surface, and then you're able to see more of the surface area, which is actually purple and not a black color. No doubt this is the most amount of barrel that I've encountered in a day in any section of Roosevelt National Forest, though this is only my fourth trip to this part of Colorado. so. Maybe this is just a more common amount. There are mines in the area. None of the crystals I collected were from the mines. Just a testimony to how abundant this stuff is. There's no doubt that some of these mines were being used for extraction of barrel as a beryllium ore for the war. As for this one, I'd call it good luck, but you know, you find a good zone, you cover enough ground and observant along the way, you're gonna stumble upon magical minerals. Number one tip and takeaway for prospectors and rock hounds, 2.6 kilograms, is acknowledge that these are metamorphic pegmatites. They're different than granitic pegmatites. They're not forming pockets with crystals pointing in towards one another. These are forming locked up in the rock. So in the zoned pegmatite, find the mineral that you're looking for in the actual rock and unless you feel like breaking that rock up, then go downhill from that because chances are, since the Pleistocene, all of these minerals have weathered out and are just obscured in the top surface layers of soil. I noticed that the color of the barrel did vary by pegmatite. So some are green blue, definitive blue, light blue, and then also a yellow cast, AKA low grade heliodor. This is the highest quality specimen collected. I would call that aquamarine, but it is a low grade aquamarine. This of course is what aquamarine is supposed to look like. I don't think we're quite there yet on this channel, but we'll get there.
Now on to my favorite minerals on the table. This is columbite. The radioactivity is 63 counts per minute, which is not significantly high, but a useful diagnostic. Columbite forms a solid solution series with tantalite. So based on the amount of tantalum in the structure of this mineral right here, you get one of two end members. Columbite, which is deprived of tantalum, or tantalite, which has tantalum in its structure. You tell the difference between the two by specific gravity. Specific gravity of this sample uh, these samples average to be 5.9. Maybe the largest piece of columbite that I ever get to touch. And if there's a reason for me to go back to these pegmatites, it's to pursue the origin of this and look for more like it. Columbite has many utilities in aerospace and medical industry, and I will likely do another video exclusively on this mineral. And finally, let's propose a hypothesis for the formation of the pegmatites with this high concentration of incompatible elements in the area. Geology is a very speculative science. There's a lot of room for interpretation, and in my opinion, that makes it really fun. This is the theory that I'm going with that I feel most confident about for how we can produce columbite crystals of this size size. Beginning with the base rock in the area, this is the rock that the majority of the video took place on. This is a metasedimentary rock called a mica schist, and this is the result of metamorphosing a slate or a mudstone. The direction of these tourmaline crystals within the schist tell us something about the regional stress field. The direction of maximum stress that created this is going to be perpendicular to these mineral grains, and that's oriented up and down perpendicular to the crystals because the crystals are going to grow out during the metamorphic event and that's how we arrive at this rock and now let's have a look at the buckhorn mountain quadrangle this is a geologic map the video actually took place a little over here but this has all the information that we'll need we were in this light brown unit this is the mica schist so that is this rock right here this brown unit the first symbol that i want to bring attention to is this right here so this is a strike and dip symbol of the foliation of metamorphic rock this is telling us that the foliation or the lines of the metamorphic rock are oriented like that and we can infer the stress field from that so maximal compression is like this on a regional scale mountain building event tectonic forces pushing up and pushing down creating mountains in this region that made the rock have this orientation. So if we were to collect this sample in the field, that's how it would be laying on the surface, showing us the stress field. Next, let's have a look at two sets of dikes. Uh, this dike swarm of these mafic dikes, these red lines, those are dikes. And notice that these cut through the foliation of the rock, meaning they're discordant. We were not looking at these. These are not fractionated enough to produce the incompatible elements and exotic minerals found in this video. We are looking at these blue lines. These are pegmatites, so a different dike swarm and probably related to a different geologic event. And notice that these dikes are concordant, meaning they follow the foliation of the metamorphic rock. And I believe that they're related to an igneous process. So this is a geologic map that shows what's on the surface of the earth and what rock units are observed from the surface. But if we take that up and we imagine that there's a magma chamber that cooled and solidified beneath the surface of the earth, that would produce the necessary ingredients, incompatible elements and exolved late stage fluids that could then permeate between the defoliation of the metamorphic rock, giving rise to these unique pegmatites in the area. And finally, I believe that the pegmatites of Crystal Mountain Pegmatite District are related in age to one of two igneous events, that is the emplacement of the silver plume granite or the emplacement of the Boulder Creek granite diorite. These are pluton complexes, meaning that there's multiple magma chambers solidifying at different levels throughout the region. So who's to say that one of these magma chambers didn't solidify beneath Crystal Mountain Pegmatite District, providing the necessary ingredients, volatiles, and incompatible elements to produce exotic minerals in these pegmatites. I think the best way we can find out is to explore. So let's go get out there.